Well, hello, everyone. Um, it is that hour, so we're going to get started uh, with our event today, Archive Love, Stories from Special Collections. Um, welcome to the University of Iowa Library Special Collections. I'm Elizabeth Reardon. I'm the Outreach and Engagement Librarian for this department. And today, we're looking to celebrate love and some of its many forms. Um, we're going to share with you some of our favorite items from our collections and hopefully have a lot of fun for you this Friday. Um, there will be some time at the end of this talk, uh, at the end of the presentation to take any questions you might have. And while we are recording this talk, we will not be recording the questions portion at the end of this event. So to start, I wanted to do a fun little exercise for everybody here and, and talk about one of my favorite collections. Um, this is just something really silly and fun that I, I really enjoy in our collection. We have a miniature book collection here in Special Collections with around 4,000 books that are three inches or less. That's what makes it a miniature book. And topics vary greatly within this collection. Uh, and I have to say my favorite is this item right here, which is the little flirt. Uh, this book is from 1871 um, and it provides proper ways to flirt and communicate with handkerchiefs, gloves, fans, and parasols. Now, this, uh, this book was printed by A.J. Fisher in New York, and Fisher was known for publishing and printing Valentine cards. So I think this was more of a book for fun than an actual serious guide, but we're gonna explore a little bit here and practice some fan flirtations. Now, I chose fans because I'm tired of gloves because uh, it is winter and I don't have a parasol um, and my handkerchiefs are all dirty. So <laughs> also, I have this amazing fan my aunt gave me that I've been dying to use now for a few years. And so I encourage all of you to grab a fan if you have one or make one out of a piece of paper that you might have sitting next to you uh, and, and practice some of these, some of these moves. Um, so the first one is if you're fanning fast, that means you're engaged. So kind of, you know, but not taken. So you can still come and talk to me, but I'm engaged come at your own risk, I guess. But if I'm fanning slow, it means I'm married. Letting it rest on my right cheek means yes. My left cheek, no, don't come any further. Um, open and shutting it. So doing one of those, there's feathers flying everywhere, means you are cruel. But opening it wide means wait for me. Shutting it, I have changed which I'm not quite sure what that means, but placing it on the right ear, you have changed. <laughs> twirling it in the left hand, which I don't know if it means twirling it open or closed, but let's say closed. I wish to get rid of you. So I kind of see it as kind of like a move along motion, but twirling it in the right hand means I love another. So as you twirl it, this is letting them down easy. But then the key moment here, is if you take the handle of your fan or your piece of paper, whatever you have right now, and put it to your lips, it means kiss me, according to this book anyway. Um, and so I don't know about all of you, but these last 11 months have made me feel a bit like a feral cat. Uh, and I don't know how to communicate with the outside world anymore, but I feel like a book like this uh, is gonna be great and help, I'm gonna bring it out uh, when I go back into the real world, I think a little bit after the pandemic. So. That's just something little fun. If you want to learn more about flirting with the fan, there's still more pages about it, or there's handkerchiefs and gloves and parasols. Like I said, come check it out here at Special Collections. But I'm going to move over now and introduce our university archivist, David McCartney, to talk to you a little about, about some of his favorite things. Thank you, Liz. And thank you for the flirtation lesson. I'm going to remember those codes now. Well, maybe I won't use them, but I'll at least remember them. I, I'm so glad you're all here today, and we really are looking forward to sharing some of our uh, resources with you this afternoon for Valentine's Day. Uh, on the theme of flirting, I thought I might talk for a few minutes about uh, a rather refined, uh, further refinement of the uh, act of flirting, and that is the use of dance cards. Um, maybe you've heard the expression, my dance card is full. Uh, in modern times, that uh, expression has been used uh, metaphorically uh, when they say, uh, when, you, when you hear a friend say, pencil me into your dance card or, uh, or my dance card is full. That means that um, 
uh, I'm too busy, sorry, my dance card is full. Or pencil me in might mean spend some time with me, who knows. But uh, there, there actually is a, a very a practical basis for this in the in the early 21st century, we might think of this in, in metaphorical terms, but there, there is a history of dance cards. They uh, appear to have originated in the uh, late 1700s. And uh, uh, we, we think that they really uh, can be traced to the, the Viennese waltz, the, the uh, ballroom dancing that had become so popular in the uh, late, mid to late uh, 18th century. Uh, but it wasn't until about 1892 that the term dance card appeared in uh, English and in uh, English and then later uh, American culture. Dance engagements, uh, dance engagement cards will uh, appear mainly as adjuncts to an event, historically uh, beginning with the uh, uh, customs in uh, Austria, later exported to uh, uh, Great Britain and uh, 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 elsewhere in Western Europe. These were uh, accessories and eventually became used as souvenirs of, uh, of events. And this uh, practice uh, continued uh, here in the United States. Uh, beginning in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century. So uh, a dance card. A dance card will show a list of all of the uh, scheduled dances for the evening. Typically, there will be a schedule of dances prepared in advance uh, by the uh, uh, event planners. This was certainly true in Vienna, and the custom even carried well into the 20th century here in the United States. The uh, dance card itself is typically a, a booklet and it includes a decorative cover and uh, some other information. Um, let's go to the next slide and I'll tell you a bit about the uh, Mary Ingram dance card collection. This is, uh, as you can tell from the label, it is collection number RG2.004.002. Mary uh, Ingram uh, uh, apparently collected these cards. We don't know anything uh, about her, unfortunately. Uh, the collection arrived at our doorstep several years ago. These came from a donor in Northwestern Iowa. Uh, there was no accompanying information as to the uh, provenance or uh, origin of these uh, dance cards. And I unfortunately did not receive a response after I wrote to the donor uh, asking for uh, more information. What we do know is these are all pertaining to University of Iowa social events, almost all of them uh, 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 concerning students. And they cover a date span of about 1915 to 1955. And uh, they depict all kinds of events, traditions that uh, for the most part are no longer observed. Uh, events like the Spinster Spree, which uh, I believe is a take on Sadie Hawkins, military ball, uh, fraternity and sorority programs and, and uh, so forth. Uh, the next slide, please. We have over 200 of these and they span some, uh, as I said, some 40 years, 1915 to 1955. On this uh, sampler that uh, uh, you're looking at, the uh, upper left corner is a dance card from the annual spring Mecca event. Mecca was uh, for many years, a uh, uh, social event sponsored by students in the College of Engineering. And the letters represent the uh, first letters of the College of Engineering's departments at that time, much like the word Visha at Iowa State University, uh, the uh, annual spring open house, which represented the, the uh, uh, first letters of the uh, six original colleges of uh, Iowa State. Same with Mecca at the College of Engineering. Uh, I mentioned the military ball. There may be other events, uh, the spinster spree, homecoming, all kinds of events are documented in these, uh, in these cards. Uh, next slide, please. You open the cards up and you notice that these document 
information about the events more specifically. And lo and behold, we have chaperones, so be careful. They are uh, dignitaries, including the president and the first lady of the uh, university at, uh, at some of these events. I might uh, point out that these dance cards really represent a wide range of uh, artistic achievements. Um, there are uh, materials, uh, a variety of materials that have gone into their uh, preparation over the years, paper and cardboard, of course, uh, but also laminate. Uh, we have some that are made of pressed metal uh, as supplies uh, allowed. Uh, even during World War II, there were uh, uh, a few extravagances, but not many. Uh, leather, suede, uh, really uh, uh, a wide range of material that uh, had gone into the uh, preparation of these as events budgets would allow. The cards inside, as you, as you can see, reveal a lot more about that evening. Uh, they include information about names of dance partners, um, maybe the songs played, uh, some of the cards that we received have no names in them at all, which uh, makes me pause for a moment to speculate. Uh, was the card given as a souvenir later? Or uh, more difficult to consider, perhaps, is the question that there was no one to dance with that evening. Records sometimes tease us that way by being more cryptic than not. But these 200 or so dance cards really do reveal uh, uh, a lot about uh, uh, special events on campus over a, a period of time that uh, 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 function differently uh, for us socially than, than uh, today. You can find more about the dance cards in special collections. The uh, uh, Mary Ingram dance card collection is our primary source. We have a couple of other smaller collections as well. And you can find a lot of dance cards online as well if you go into uh, Wikimedia Commons and uh, look up dance card uh, online collections uh, from there. You'll find hundreds, if not thousands of uh, samples uh, uh, that way as well. That's my part. And next we'll move along to the uh, Iowa Women's Archives. Thank you, David. Yes, now we're gonna hear a little bit from Iowa Women Archives processing librarian, Anna Tunnicliffe. Hi, I'm Anna Tunnicliffe. My little box at the top says Dan, but rest assured that's not me. I'm just on someone else's computer today. Um, at the Iowa Women's Archives, we aim to preserve the history of Iowa women from all walks of life. So as you can imagine, our collections do include things like dance cards, uh, valentines, and plenty of love letters between women and their lovers. We, uh, as I was listening to David, I was reminded we actually had a donation of dance cards a couple of years ago that came in all tangled together in a big knot. You may have noticed the cards had those nice, smooth little strings on them, the little tassels and major kudos to our conservation department that managed to get those separated. Um, but today I've uh, chosen to start talking in keeping with the theme about dances and romance from a slightly different perspective. The next few slides will be devoted to romances between women. As you can imagine, straight women are well represented in our collections, but I think some of the funniest and some of the mushiest items come from our lesbians' papers. Can we get to the next slide? I'd like to start by examining some flyers for women's only dances in the 1970s and 1980s. During this time period, women in Iowa City and around the country took part in the li women's liberation movement, an explosion of women-centered activities and feminist thought Women's only spaces at this time came not from being excluded from men's spaces, although that certainly created a need for them, but from a feminist impulse. Women wanted places to be themselves and discover themselves in a women-centered community. For a time, Iowa City had a women's only restaurant. At various times, there was also a women's bookstore, a women's press, and a women's coffee house that allowed men, but catered to the experiences and needs of women. 
It's important to note that these weren't exclusively lesbian spaces, but they were LGBTQ friendly, which was a pretty big deal at the time. Women's only dances fit right in in Iowa City's lesbian feminist community. A woman's only dance gave women a space where they could be free from men's harassment and gave lesbian couples an event where they could be openly together without fear. These flyers that we're looking at came from the Joe Rabinald papers and they're a couple of my favorites. These dances, one rock and roll themed and another for Valentine's Day with the Dead Flower Band uh, were held at the local Unitarian Church, AKA 10 South Gilbert Street which is no longer in use, but I think you can still see the building on the corner of Gilbert and Iowa. The sweet postcard in the corner of two women dancing is filed with all of the flyers, which I think adds a little bit of vintage romance to the whole thing. Can I have the next slide? But as you can see from this flyer from the Iowa City Feminist Reunion Records, it wasn't all about romance. I don't know who put together this Valentine's Day massacre flyer, but it's downright hostile to February 14th. Um, instead of Cupid, we've got Carrie Nation. Can we have the close up there? And uh, she was a notorious prohibition activist known for smashing into bars and saloons with a hatchet. Here she's turned her anger towards Valentine's Day, destroying a shop selling flowers, cards, and candy. Um, can you imagine seeing this flyer up at your local coffee house and thinking, yeah, that's where I wanna spend Valentine's Day. The uh, anti-couple sentiment is completed with the pricing. You can see at the very bottom of the flyer, all women were welcome, but it cost a dollar for single women and 750 for couples. Uh, next slide, please. Now here's a dance that's more traditionally romantic prom. Miranda Welch is pictured here on the right of both photos. She graduated from Webster City High School right near the smack dab of Iowa in 2006. Her collection is kind of unusual because she donated the papers after she graduated from the university and normally we get papers from women towards the end of their lives. So this documents kind of um, an unusual time. We don't have many collections like this. Um, while a student at Webster City High School, Welch took the bold move of coming out and taking her girlfriend to prom, and you can see their nice picture there. Although 2006 might not seem so long ago, it was before coming out was all that common or widely accepted, but Welch was the kind of woman who stood up for herself. Uh, in high school, she was already an activist and a feminist. She participated in the Day of Silence to support LGBTQ students. And her senior high school quote was from Anais Nin, a mid 20th century author who lent a woman's point of view to more erotic books. In her senior year, Welch won an honorary Matthew Shepard scholarship named for Matthew Shepard, a college student who was tortured and killed for his sexual orientation in 1998. The scholarship honored an out student from Iowa it helped Welch attend the University of Iowa and study gender, women, and sexuality studies. She would continue her feminist activism here through working with organizations like RAC and marching in Take Back the Night. Welch graduated in 2010, donated her papers to us, which was really nice, and moved to Wisconsin where she currently lives with her wife, Jess, and practices midwifery. Can we get to the next slide? Decades earlier, in a very different time to be a lesbian, Joanne Weldon came to the University of Iowa. She attended in the 1950s. You can see her student ID here at the bottom of the slide. She was noted by her friends for her quote, masculine style. And she publicly acknowledged herself as a lesbian even in the 1950s, pretty big deal. I don't know much about her life as a student, but years later, Weldon had plenty of romance. Joanne Weldon and Sharon Rash fell in love well after college and lucky for us, several of their love letters made it to the IWA. The couple had nicknames for each other. You can kind of see at the top of this card, Sharon was Mother Bunny Rabbit and Joanne was A Peach. You can see it in a lot of their cards and letters. Their cards are full of love and darling poetry. One card read, 
I used to wonder if what people said was true, that love is best and brightest at the beginning. And now I know the answer, at least for us, because the longer we're together, the more I find to love about you. Happy Valentine's Day. Although the two couldn't be legally married in their lifetimes, they were united in holy union at Metropolitan Community Church in Davenport, Iowa in 1988. The next year's Valentine card read, this is my Valentine to you, my heart, my life, the most I can give you, my most beautiful wife, myself. And there we go. Thank you so much, Anna, for that. And next we're gonna have a look at some of our comic book collections from curator of science fiction and popular culture collections, Peter Balisteri. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I just wanna give you a, a, a few moments of uh, a little bit of fun. And we're going to look at some superhero comics and at some romance comics. And uh, I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, we're mainly going to just be looking at covers, uh, but I think that you'll get a good sense of how much uh, romance, marriage, uh, uh, both the, uh, the highlights and, and uh, the lows are represented in uh, comic stories and comic art. Romance comics begin in 1947 uh, with the publication of Young Romance. After World War II, uh, especially among adult readers, the interest in superhero comics began to wane. And uh, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, uh, famous comics duo uh, a partnership, come out with uh, uh, Young Romance Comics. Uh, this, uh, this duo of Simon and Kirby created Captain America. And Joe Simon went on to be the editor of Timely Comics, which morphed into Marvel Comics. So these are two pretty big names in comics. And they come out with Young Romance, and that's followed uh, by Young Love very soon. And, and then the whole genre of romance comics just takes off. Uh, there was a love glut, something called the love glut, that began in uh, 1950. It ran from January to about April. And it was just a, a massive increase in the number of titles of romance comics, shooting up to over 120 different titles during the period of January to April of 1950. And after the love glut, starting in 1950, there's a real decline in romance comics. And that goes all the way up until 1977 when uh, uh, effectively the genre kind of comes apart. So about 1947 to about 1977 uh, uh, is the range. And let's look at some superheroes and, and their romance. Please, Liz, next slide. So I started out with uh, Lois Lane, uh, a good indication, uh, popular culture, uh, the study of popular culture is the study of uh, uh, popular culture, using it as a lens to look at things like gender, uh, 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 race, politics, all kinds of different things. And so right off the bat, you know, uh, I had always thought my whole life that these were Lois Lane comics. Uh, but actually the title of the comic is Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane. So yes, they gave Lois her own comic, uh, but they had to make sure that you, you know, understood that uh, she's just Superman's girlfriend. Uh, we've got the uh, comic on the left. You see that, uh, uh, this is a, a sort of a, an idea where there's two different Supermans. One of them marries Lois Lane, and then there's another Superman, and he's uh, going to marry his, uh, uh, his other sweetheart, uh, Lana Lang. Uh, the alliteration of the Superman uh, girlfriends is always kind of fabulous. 
Uh, on the right, we've got, uh, uh, you know, a, a nice fantasy element uh, where uh, Lois is about to marry the devil and uh, uh, some fun there. Uh, next slide, please. Oh yeah, this is a this is a great one. Uh, so Superman has started some kind of a contest, and he's told uh, uh, these women warriors that uh, uh, the one that can defeat him uh, will be able to marry him. And you know he says, "Great Krypton, I never dreamed it could happen. For the first time in my life, I've been beaten by a girl." And of course, you know, what's the penalty? <laughs> the penalty is marriage. Uh, uh, so yeah, you've got a lot going on there. Uh, nice cover though. Okay, so uh, Supergirl. Uh, interestingly, uh, a lot of the Supergirl comics relate to either love or romance in one aspect or another. Uh, not surprising, but uh, uh, still kind of outrageous uh the comic on the left the beast that loved supergirl and you know look everyone linda's monster boyfriend has exposed her supergirl identity well that's always going on in superhero uh, comics this uh, protection you know that they're trying to protect their their secret identities and of course uh you know it's revealed by a monster who's crazy about her uh, I think of this monster as kind of uh, like being the dud. If any of you are familiar with the board game uh, a Mystery Date, it featured a character called the dud. This monster is definitely the dud. The comic on the right, uh, uh, you know, here's an expression that probably uh, for many different reasons at different times, both men and women have uh, uh, thought to them, have had similar thoughts. What's the good of being a supergirl helping everyone if I can't even get a date? Uh, you know, this idea that, yeah, life is great. I'm doing all these wonderful things, but where's the romance? Well, I'll look at this cover. Uh, not only is she looking at romance through the window, so, you know, she's outside looking in, but this kitty, this kitty uh, uh, licking her hand, uh, just unbelievable. Next slide, please. With Batman, you've always, you know, you've got this wide range of characters. It's kind of like Superman, but there's actually even more characters. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, here's the marriage of Batman and Batwoman. And Robin's thought is, gosh, what'll become of me now? <laughs> And, you know, that could be interpreted in so many different ways, and not all of them very progressive. Uh, uh, you know, but, but he's worried about his position in the team. Uh, is Batwoman going to ace him out of the Batman-Robin team? Or uh, is it uh, 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 Batman's affection for Robin? Uh, uh, there's a lot going on there. Batman family giant on the right. Robin and Batgirl, I pronounce you man and wife. Till death do you part. This is really interesting because it turns up in a lot of different comics. The part of the marriage ceremony that they want to emphasize is the death do you part uh, uh, aspect. Of course, you know, that's where the drama and the conflict is. And, and you know, we can kind of see where it's going. Uh, uh, but here's Robin getting married and, and marrying Batgirl. So there you've got, you know, uh, all the different members uh, uh, try and marriage out in one way or another. Next slide, please. Adventure Comics, Legion of Superheroes. And uh, uh, this was uh, uh, this was one of the uh, comics that featured uh, reader involvement. If you look down on the left at the bottom, superpowers of new Legionnaires suggested by our readers. This was something that DC did over the years. They would ask readers to help out with suggestions of new superheroes or new powers, new, new uh, uh, groups, all different kinds of things. And it was just a way to involve the readers. You know, with this one, we've got Saturn Girl and Lightning Lad, Phantom Girl and Ultra Boy married. So it's a double wedding and uh, you're pairing up these uh, uh, favorite members. 
One of the things that I love about uh, uh, this cover, look at the, the sticks that they're holding up. So this, this uh, a double uh, sort of column or row of legionnaires that the uh, brides and grooms are walking through, they're walking under what normally in terms of a military wedding would be crossed swords. But the, the artist has chosen to use small puppets <laughs> or small uh, uh, dolls of the individual legionnaires and they're on the ends of sticks. So it's, it's sort of crossed doll legionnaires that they're passing under. Uh, I, I, that's a great cover. Next slide, please. Okay, Jonah Hex, not necessarily considered a superhero by everybody. Uh, but he is uh, 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 vaguely uh, 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 invulnerable. So uh, he's got that going for him. He's also, you know, a, a dead shot uh, and uh, has survived many, many tough scrapes. Here he is. And uh, we get this ironic sense again. Uh, we come to give you a wedding present, Hex. Uh, Jonah, and I love the, the banner at the top above the Jonah Hex title. Jonah is going to a blood wedding, his own. <laughs> and next to it, we've got Animal Man. Animal Man is a, a, a lesser, uh, depending on whether or not you're a fan, I guess. But Animal Man is a lesser DC superhero who can transform himself into any uh, animals that are nearby. Uh, this is an amazing co cover and, and uh, uh, one of Liz's favorites. Uh, it's an amazing cover. You can see that there are, uh, that the, the minister and the uh, uh, bridal party in the background are apes. And this cover represents a dream or a hallucination that Animal Man has uh, during the course of the comic. But uh, what a cover, what a wedding. Okay, next comment. I mean, next slide, please. Spider-Man. Yeah, we're going to wrap this up, I think, with superheroes on Spider-Man. And of course, you know, again, it's the extended family for the, the hero, right? This is Aunt May. And Spider-Man is losing his mind because Aunt May is marrying one of his biggest enemies, Dr. Octopus, uh, or Doc Ock. And uh, uh, again, you know, we get this idea, Doc Ock says, but it will wall crawler over your dead body. So this combination of death and marriage uh, uh, going on. Uh, nice cover, though, really beautiful cover. Oh, one more, Giant Size Avengers. Actually, there's a couple more, that's right. Giant Size Avengers, we've got some Avengers getting married there, Scarlet Witch and Vision. And of course, now we have WandaVision on the Disney Channel, the new series that features uh, the two of them, uh, are supposed to be excellent, haven't started watching it yet. Next slide. Incredible Hulk. And again, just a great cover with all these people, uh, except for the bride, turning around and looking at uh, uh, some uh, terror uh, uh, that's approaching. Uh, that's Bruce Banner there uh, getting married. X-Men. Again, uh, uh, not exactly like a happy marriage uh, going on here. I don't know. I guess that was my theme. <laughs> Fantastic Four. This is one of the most famous and one of the only married couples in uh, uh, comics. And, of course, that's uh, uh, the Reed family, the Reeds. Uh, uh, Sue and Reed. Uh, uh, no, not the Reed family. Richards. I'm blanking. Sorry. But uh, uh, both of them married, and, and that from the early days of Fantastic Four. Okay, next slide. Kazar, enjoying our honeymoon, dear. And, of course, here you've got Kazar the Savage and his bride. And uh, uh, it looks like a pterodactyl holding a medieval sword. You know, there's just, uh, there's no limit to the imagination when it comes to comics. But, again, uh, uh, sort of a negative, uh, 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 <laughs> negative theme. Okay, here we go. Uh, we're, we're on the cusp here of uh, a romance and superhero. Uh, uh, Sinister House of Secret Love. I just love these titles. And the Dark Mansion of Forbidden Love. You know, amazing. 
And so we've got, uh, what's interesting is that the comic on the left calls itself a graphic novel of gothic terror. Uh, graphic novel and comic, uh, uh, you know, uh, from the early days right until now, uh, being a contentious sort of a thing, no hard, fast definition for graphic novels. Uh, on the right, Secret of the Missing Bride, uh, uh, interesting here, two really sort of spooky, almost horror romance comics. Now, here's two more, Just Married and Girls Love, Unhappy Bride and For Better or For Worse. Go. Oh, Yesterday's Kisses. Why do I let him do this to me? He's just as bad now as he was before. Career Girl Romances and Private Secretary. There were a lot of uh, romance comics that uh, uh, would single out either nurses or secretaries and the secretary always wants to marry the boss the nurse always wants to marry the doctor again you know the feminist uh, uh, lens to look at these comics falling in love in teen confessions uh, uh, I'm sorry Gina I thought you were that kind of a girl oh how could you how could you so it's not the, the woman saying, I'm not that kind of girl. It's the guy saying, I thought you were that kind of girl. Uh, his kind of chick in Teen Confessions. You know, don't forget that these comics are all being written by men. Uh, so, you know, we're getting a lot of male, heavy male attitudes coming through. If she's the kind of girl he wants, then I'll be exactly like her. Girls' romances and I love you. Uh, what kind of girl am I? How to hunt your man? Rebel heart. So this is, uh, 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 I hope he doesn't tell Fred about Saturday night. Hi, babe. Remember me from Eddie's party? <laughs> hey, babe. Again, the bad boy, right? The, the supposed attraction. Girls love and love stories. Love from a stranger. Oh, I love this. What kind of girl am I? I don't even know his name and I don't care. I just want his kisses. I may be ruining my life, but I can't help myself. Next slide. Oh, we're at the end. And of course, I love this comic. The first time I saw it many, many years ago, as we were just beginning to open up the amazing collection, close to 20,000 comics of all kinds from both independent and major comic uh, 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 producers in the Keating Dugarm Comics Collection. And a lot of the romance comics all coming from the Jen Wolf comic book collection. Uh, but this one comes out of DeGarm and, you know, uh, it asks the uh, uh, serious question here. There he is, Nicole, who is it, him or me? I don't know where I belong in Johnny's arms or with Peter. Well, obviously we know the answer to that question. Uh, she's much better off with Peter. And uh, uh, I wanna thank everybody so much and uh, let's move on to uh, Tim Scheidt. Thanks so much, Peter. And finally, to wrap it all up for us tonight, uh, or today, I should say, uh, is International Data Archivist, uh, Tim Scheip. Hi, thanks. Um, well, I'm going to end on kind of a cynical note of love. Uh, uh, sorry about that, but this is Dada. You know? um, I've chosen one of the many collections of illustrations by the Berlin Dada artist, George Gross. Um, you know, the Dada movement in Berlin started in 1917 uh, when Richard Hilsenbeck returned to Germany from Switzerland, where he was one of the founders of Dada in Zurich. And remember that this is towards the end of World War I, uh, when German society is on the verge of collapse and anti-war sentiment is on the rise. So Dada in Berlin was very political and was also closely allied with the German communists. So much of German Dada art was anti-war and highly political. And then after the war, the Dadaists uh, turned their attention to criticizing the new supposedly democratic Weimar Republic that replaced the German empire and attacking the economic and social situation in post-war Germany. Um, like several other Berlin Dadaists, Gross anglicized his name to protest the war. That's why he's George and not Georg. Um, he's probably Germany's best known caricaturist, and he's known for his pointedly grotesque uh, portrayals of the ruling classes and of the disparity between Germany's haves and have-nots. 
So the book we're looking at today uh, is from 1930, which is well after the Dada period, but the style is very consistent with Gross's Dada period. Um, the book is Love Above All. And as you'll see, uh, the title is meant rather ironically. So Gross is depicting love as a transaction, largely between the rich and the poor. So the overriding theme of the book is basically sex trafficking and prostitution. So you, clearly we're not talking about romantic love. Uh, could you see the next slide, please? Uh, this, is the, this is the title page. And I'm gonna read a translation of uh, Gross's brief preface to the book to tell you what he's all about here. So love above all. The title shows that the subject here is interpersonal relations, fine. But don't expect my drawings to illustrate any run-of-the-mill lover's idol. Realist that I am, I use my pen and brush primarily for taking down what I see and observe. And that is generally unromantic, sober, and not very dreamy. The devil knows why it's so, but when you take a closer look, people and objects become somewhat shabby, ugly, and often meaningless or ambiguous. My critical observation always resembles a question as to meaning, purpose, and goal, but there is seldom a satisfying answer. So in place of it, I put down my graphic marks, sober and with no mystery. So people pass each other by, blank spaces remain where they were. I attempt to capture this with the means I am given. I raise my hand and hail the eternal human law and the cheerful good for nothing immu immutability of life. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So most of uh, Gross's illustration uh, touch in some way on the unequal power dynamics uh, that are going on in each scene. And his typical approach is to have a caption that seems relatively innocent and then undercut the caption with the picture. So here's the first page spread. Captions are mostly in German. So I'm just including the caption on this first one. Um, just so you can see the layout. So the title is The Beginning of Spring, and it's a cafe scene. Uh, you'll see that the men in these drawings generally appear rather well off and rather sleazy. Here you get the idea that the men come to this cafe with a purpose in mind other than drinking coffee. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is second income. Uh, so a woman scouting for potential customers on a busy street. Uh, Gross often uses his captions to emphasize the economic aspect of prostitution. Next slide. Uh, this, this is titled Total Devotion, Total Devotion from Five to Seven. Gross, Gross draws a lot of scenes in dance halls where men pay by the dance and uh, presumably head elsewhere afterwards. And you'll note how the caption plays on the notion of a couple being totally devoted to each other, but then undercuts the notion with the phrase from five to seven. So we imagine businessmen stopping here after work before heading home to their families. Uh, next, please. Triste, it's sad. Uh, so the caption here is in French instead of German and alludes to the uh, ancient saying that says essentially all men are sad after sex uh, with a whole range of misogynistic overtones. Next, please. Transit trade. Again, it's a brutal, brutal assessment of the economic aspects of uh, prostitution as is the next image. Uh, Supply and demand, I uh, don't need to comment. Uh, next, uh, again, another French caption, savoir vivre, uh, knowing how to live or living the good life. Uh, so another disreputable cafe scene. Next, this is a cozy place. It's something you might expect to hear from an innocent young couple in a cafe, but Obviously not what's going on here. Next. 
two weeks home leave. And this image is a bit more ambiguous. Um, uh, the relationship between the sailor and the woman is unclear and we don't see their faces. Uh, but I think since the sailor is on home leave rather than some distant port, I suspect the woman's a girlfriend rather than a prostitute. But here what comes to the fore is the uh, divide between the couple and the well-to-do well patrons who are observing them rather coldly. Next, do you like me just a little bit? Um, it looks like it's the woman who's speaking here. It's not certain, but uh, I think the line is probably something of a cliche in this situation and maybe an attempt to shift the power dynamics a little. Having a good time. Next slide. Having a good time. Uh, another cafe scene. Here, having a good time seems to entail the figures on the left humiliating themselves for the amusement of the well-to-do clientele. And next, and the last image, those who live on love. Uh, and it actually brings in another major theme for Gross and other Berlin Dadaists, which is the uh, former soldiers who had been injured or disfigured in the war and who are common sight on the streets of Berlin. Uh, the man on the left is wearing a sign indicating that he's blind, deaf, and mute. Uh, Gross's illustrations of these war wounded uh, inevitably include a host of passersby ignoring them. Um, and just to end on a slightly more positive note, I should mention George Gross actually married uh, an, an art student, Ava Pater, in 1920, and they were happily married for 40 years. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. So thank you, everyone. Um, love is a celebrated thing for sure, but it's also a complicated thing. But here in Special Collections, we love it all and hope you will come and fall in love with some items of yourself here in Special Collections. So thank you.